Father. You are a good, good Father. You're an everlasting Father. You're a wonderful counselor. You're a prince of peace. You're the eternal God. You're our Redeemer. And you're our Savior and friend, Lord. And in you, we find our meaning for life. In you, we find our purpose for life. In you, we become who you desire for us to be. But not only that, we become who we desire to truly be. Lesson number six of the series, Rebuilding the Broken Places. And I really feel deep within me that today there's some of you out there where the pressure to stop is greater than your desire to continue. That you have been doing a good work. You have maybe been trying to change your life. You have worked on a situation, a relationship. You have been working on rebuilding the broken places in and around your life, but you have been doing it for a while and it seems like the pressure against you has gotten so intense and s increased so much that you are in a place where your desire to continue may not even be there anymore. Listen, I know what I'm talking about. I've been there with you before. I've, I've been there where it just feels like the pain, the problems, the situations, all the issues. And don't forget the people, the people that just bring so much negativity, hurt, say so many different things. All of that just working against you when you're simply trying to rebuild the broken places. I shouldn't have said simply because it's not a simple thing, but you're working on rebuilding the broken places. You're doing the work God wants you to do. You're trying to re rebuild a relationship. You're trying to take care of family members. You're trying to deal with difficult situations. You're trying to work into the in the community. You're trying to do, you're simply doing what God desires for you to do, but the pressure the pressure that has come against you has been so great that it has overwhelmed your determination to stop. If that's you, I have just a few things to share with you today. You see, because when the pressure builds, Sometimes that pressure builds because you're so close to the end. Sometimes that pressure builds because you are doing a great work. You're doing God's work. And we all have an enemy and there's enemies that the enemy uses to hinder us from continuing that work, to try to stop us in our tracks, to distort what we're doing or even try to discredit 
all that we have accomplished. See, the pressure often gets greater the closer we are to the end of something. You know, I ran track, some of you know this, I ran track back in college and I, I ran several different events. And what always interests me was the difference between the events. And it wasn't just about the distance, but it was also about the strategy I had to put into it or the thought I had to put into running the race. You see, when I ran the 100 meter dash, it was pretty much building up. I was building up speed all the way to the finish line. If you watch a 100 meter dash in the Olympics or some sort of uh, world uh, race or event, what you'll notice is that those runners are building up momentum as they go down the track. Now, the 200 meter dash, I also ran that, and it's pretty much you build up momentum and then you maintain it all the way to the finish line, but the other race, the final race I ran, was the 400 meter dash. And anyone who's a quarter miler or has ever ran that race, or even if you watch people run that race, one time around the track outdoor, 400 meters, what you would notice is that by the time people get to the finish line, they are pretty much out of it. They're, all their energy is gone. You know why? Because in that race, you build up momentum, you increase your speed, but then you get to a point where that lactic acid starts to build. And the pain begins to increase. And the pressure for you to slow down or to stop becomes so strong that your mind, or I should say your body, is telling you, you need to slow down, you need to stop while your mind might be saying, you better keep going. You see in the 400 meter dash, the closer you get to the finish line, the more pain you have to deal with, the more people that are trying to stop you from finishing the race or finishing in a certain position, and the pressure to stop intensifies. But good runners keep going because they know that they have to finish that race. They know they have to finish what they started. And they know that they are so close to the finish line. And my prayer today is that I want to encourage you. I want you to know that you are too close to stop now. Even if you cannot see the finish line ahead of you, all you see are the problems. All you feel is the pressure. All you are enduring is the pain. Even though you may not see the finish line, I want you to know you are too close to stop now. You are rebuilding relationships. You are rebuilding the broken places in your life. You're rebuilding your health. You're rebuilding your finances. You're rebuilding relationships. Or you're working and you're rebuilding others and you're rebuilding communities. You're rebuilding churches. You're doing things in the life of children and helping them out or working for a cause. You're doing a great work and you cannot stop now. You see in the book of Nehemiah, it's interesting. Because you see, Nehemiah was fired up to, to finish the wall. He encouraged all the people. We read this. We went through it if you, you've been following along. And they're rebuilding the wall. And of course, they've gotten pressure. And of course, they got, uh, had some uh, difficult situations along the way. But now, where we are in chapter 6, they're right at the, right at the end. They have, ref or they have finished rebuilding the wall. The structure of the wall is up all around Jerusalem. The problem is that they did not put in the doors or the gates the finishing touches. That's all they have to do. Put in the doors and the gates. And they're done. But listen, there's people that were not happy with them finishing. There's people that noticed that they were right there, they were right on the edge of doing something amazing, right on the edge of doing something powerful, right on the edge of changing the narrative 
for the whole community. They were right there from changing their own lives. And they were not happy at all. Let's look in the scripture. I want you to notice what happens. And then we're going to take a lesson from Nehemiah about what we should do. In verse 2, it says, So Sambalat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. There's the pressure. They were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? I love what he just said. Because what is happening is that Sambalit and Geshem, they're trying to disrupt the work. They're trying to stop him from continuing. And physically, Nehemiah was actually up higher, either because he was in Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was up on a hill, or either he was up on the wall, maybe surveying it or, or doing something, finishing touches or whatever. But he was physically up higher than where they wanted him to go. They wanted him to go to the plain of Ono, one of the villages in the, plain of o, in the plains of Ono. And he's up higher than that village. And he says, I am not going to stop to come down to where you are. See, that's why I love reading this in different versions, because here it says, why should I stop working to come and meet with you? But if you look in the New King James Version, he says, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? He's talking about his physical location, his physical state in that moment. But you know what? When I look at this, I think sometimes for us spiritually, we allow people to cause us to lower ourselves, to cause us to lower our standard because of what they want us to do. We allow people to cause us to degrade ourselves, to make us think that we're less, to make us believe that the work that we're doing is not a good work. We allow people to speak into our hearts and make us feel as if God did not call us out that God did not specifically assign us to move forward in all that he has for us to do in our families, in our communities, in our churches, or as the body of Christ. We allow folks to tell us to stop. But Nehemiah said, no, I'm not stopping the work. I'm not going to cease. I'm not going to leave where I am to come down to you. And we have to be just like that. But how can we do it? The thing we must do, if we are going to finish, if we are going to continue, if we're not going to allow the pressure to be greater than our determination, our desire to continue. Listen, we have to focus on finishing the good work God has given us. We have to focus on finishing the good work, remember that, that it is a good work that God has given us and we have to focus on finishing it. We can't stop because of what people say. We can't stop because the pressure is building up. We cannot stop because it seems like things are getting difficult. We have a good work and we have to finish. Listen, if Nehemiah would have said, okay, I'll meet you, and he got down off of that and went down there and got distracted and disrupted the work, it would not only have affected himself, but it would have impacted all those people that depended on him. It would have in impacted others that he was leading. Listen, anytime you even think about stopping the work, even anytime you think about giving up, you must remind yourself that there's so many others that are paying attention that need to see you finish so that they can finish themselves. They can finish their lives. There's people that are living today because you live. There's people who haven't given up because they know you haven't given up. There's people who would have thrown in the towel a long time ago, but because they've seen you keep moving forward, they continued to move forward as well. 
We can't give up. We can't lower our standards for anyone or anybody because we have an assignment that's good and it's from God. But let's continue because we're going to learn what else we have to do. It says, according to Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 4, four times they sent the same message. And each time I gave the same reply. Notice how consistent he was. They would come with the same message thinking, hey, he didn't get it the first time. Let's send him another message. Oh, he didn't get it that time. Let's send him a third message. They thought that they can continue the pressure upon him. And as they continue that he would happen to change. But he didn't. He continued with the same reply. I am not going to stop the work because of you. But then the scripture says, the fifth time, Sambalat's servant came with an open letter in his hand. And this is what it said. Notice the lie here. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tell it, tells me it is true that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are rebuilding or building the wall. According to reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that, come, that you come and talk it over with me. So now they are trying to intimidate him. They're trying to pressure him to stop by lying on him, by taking something that they may have heard and lying on him or starting a rumor about him. You know, it's interesting because during this time, there might have been people that had said, oh, Nehemiah is the king of Judah. He, he must be the king of Judah that the scripture talks about. There might have been people that had said that, but Nehemiah never said it. Nehemiah just doing the work that God had given them. But all these people came up with stories. All these people came up with ideas. All these people came up with different things to say about Nehemiah. But Nehemiah had to recognize something and he made it clear to them. He replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. I want you to underline that word imagining if you like writing in your Bibles or highlight it in your phones. It says they were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Notice that he said they were imagining that they could stop me. They were imagining that they could intimidate me. They were imagining that they could stop us from completing the work. You know what? There's so many people that imagine so many things about us, but that's not our problem. If folks want to have imaginations, allow their imaginations to go wild and think all this negativity against you or think what you're doing is not right or tell you that you know, what you're doing is going to lead to a negative end when you know that God has given you an assignment along with people of like precious faith to continue the love movement that Jesus started. When you know that God has spoken to you, when you know that God has led you to do this good work, people can imagine all day what they want, and they will. People can imagine anything they want about you, and they will. People can even imagine how horrible you are, imagine negative things about you, imagine you being destroyed, and they will. But listen, they can just keep imagining while you keep working. You, they can keep making up things in their mind while you are making, they happen, making things happen. You see, there's people that are always going to make up things in their minds about you. Always. But you let them go ahead and make You can't control that. You can't change that. Let them go ahead and make up things in their minds and sitting where they're sitting, doing nothing or not doing much while you're making things happen because God has given you the power to keep moving forward and to rebuild the broken places. They're imagining. But Nehemiah said, I'm going to keep doing. 
In fact, here's the point I want you to know. Your determination must be greater than any discouragement. Your determination to finish whatever it is must be greater than any discouragement that comes against you. Discouragement is is when people try to take the courage out of you or when situations try to take courage away from you. But your determination must be greater than that. Your determination to finish the race, your determination to get to the finish line has to be greater than the discouragement that comes against you. That's what we see with Nehemiah. He didn't allow them to discourage him. He didn't allow what they were imagining and what they said and the lies and all the different things. He didn't allow that to discourage him so much. Instead, his determination was on overdrive. And we have to be the same way. We have to be determined. I'm going to share some, and this might be upsetting news to you. But there's very few things in life, very few things that are life changing moves of God where we will never face discouragement. Anytime we decide to change something, anytime we decide to do something that we believe will be helpful to a community, to a people, to others, to another individual there will always be some form of discouragement around. But our job is to learn how to be determined in the midst of it all so that we won't stop. In fact, even when people or things or situations try to discourage us, it won't even phase us because we're so determined. See, our determination must be greater than any discouragement. But let's continue. There's a second part to this I want you to know. As it continues, the story says later, <laughs> they just didn't give up. Let me, let me let you know that the pressure kept building. It says later, I went to visit Shemaiah, son of Deliah, and grandson of Mehetabo, who was confined to his home. He said, let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the door shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. Sound like this person is very helpful, doesn't it? Sound like this person has his best interest at heart. But notice this. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I won't do it. See, this person Shemaiah was really trying to stop was also trying to stop the work from finishing and he did it by throwing some God stuff in it he did it by making it sound real religious real holy like right and said hey why don't you go in the temple which was actually against the rules for people just to run up in the temple if you weren't a priest And he's telling Nehemiah to go do this and to hide there because there's a possibility that he will be destroyed, that he will be killed. But I love what Nehemiah says. I think we need to take it to heart. He said, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I won't do it. There's a question we have to ask ourselves. When this stuff piles up on us, when the pressure surmounts, will we run from our position? Will you run from your position? Listen, there's too many of us that have been running away from stuff for too long. There's men who's ran from their responsibilities as family men or from children or from wives. There's women who've run out of their families uh, as, as wives, as mothers. There's, there's people that run out of situations and ran away because the pressure, it seemed, was too much. But the scripture never tells us to run away 
from anything other than sin. The scripture never tells us to run away from the work that God has for us because the pressure keeps coming at us. We're never told to run away. We're never told to give up. We're often told to press or run towards. You see it over and over and over in scripture that we press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, that we run our race with purpose, that we keep moving forward in all God has for us. I just remember so much and so often my grandmother used to sing a song. I'm going to totally mess it up, but the words were something like this. I must run on in this holy race. I must run on until I see God's face. I must run on on through sorrow and pain. I must run on even through the shame. I must run on even if I lose my best friend. I have to run on and I'll have to go to the end with wings on my feet and fire my bones. I have to run until I hear the Lord say, well done. I know I messed up some of the words there, but I think you get the point. We have to run on. We're not supposed to run from position and too many of us are running out of position. I'm so heartbroken at how many men keep running out of position. And when men are supposed to lead in their families, when men are supposed to lead in their church, I don't mean lead by telling people what to do. I mean lead by example. When men are supposed to lead in their communities, when men are supposed to lead in different situations, they are running away and finding themselves caught up in all sorts of situations, entertainment, places they shouldn't be. And we have a bunch of people that are running away and out of position. Instead of saying, this is a good work. I'm going to be the husband to one wife. I'm going to be father of my children. I'm going to love them with all that is within me. I'm going to sacrifice myself for them. I'm going to be who I need to be amongst the people of God. I'm going to be in the midst. I'm not going to run away from my own things and my own entertainment and my own shelter and security so I can feel good. Because God has given me a good work. See, we had to get to that place where we stop running from the pressure. We stop running from the things God would have for us. And instead, we keep running forward until we hear him say, well done. Nehemiah said, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I won't do it. And then he continues and says, I realized that God had not spoken to him but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sembalit had hired him. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. There it is. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Here's the other part. This is how your resolve must be greater than any intimidation. Your resolve has to be greater than any intimidation. What I mean is you have to be so focused on the finish that even what you see doesn't shake you up. See, intimidation is something that gets you so shook up, so fearful, so distraught that you will stop in your tracks. You will not move forward anymore. Because you're so worried, so scared, so fearful of moving forward. But you have to have a resolve. I remember in the Old Testament as well, the story of David. Many of you remember that as well. It's a beautiful story because there's this huge giant by the name of Goliath that's out there. He's the the warrior. He's the one that has won so many battles. And then you have this, this shepherd boy that comes out and says, hold on, who dared defy the army of the living God? Who dare talks against my God and his army? 
And the scripture will tell you, if you continue to read, when David goes out to battle, something happens. Up oh, here's that word again. David runs toward Goliath. Goliath is standing there, and David runs toward because he had a resolve in his heart. His resolve was greater than any intimidation that Goliath could muster. Goliath talked about him. Goliath was big. Everybody was saying how huge he was. But David was so focused that he ran towards the giant. Or at least that's what other people called him. David didn't even see him as a giant. And we have to have the same type of resolve that David had, that Nehemiah had, as we're talking about tonight. Our resolve must be greater must be greater than in any inter- intimidation. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, this is just a beautiful passage because you see that this pressure kept increasing. Even though he was close to the end, even though the people were close to the end, the pressure kept increasing. But Nehemiah faced it every part of the way. He didn't back down. He kept pushing against it. He kept moving forward. He said, I got a work to finish and I am going to finish this work. So what we see here in verse 15 of chapter 6, it says this. So on October 2nd or October 2, the wall was finished just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They couldn't believe it. They tried to stop them. They tried to hold them down. They tried to distract them. They tried to disrupt their progress. They tried to discourage them, intimidate them. They did everything they could. And the pressure got greater and greater and greater. But these people were determined. These people had a resolve. But let me share something with you. They were determined and they had a resolve. Not because of themselves and their own power. But notice what it says in the scripture. They realized, talking about the people of God, or excuse me, talking about the people that were uh, fearful of what the p- people of God had done. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. See, that determination was there because they knew they had the help of God. They were able to continue to move forward because they knew They had the help of God. They were able to make the changes that needed to be made because they knew they had the help of God. They were able to do these things because they knew they had the help of God, but also because the God, uh, their almighty God, our almighty God, empowered them to finish the good work that they started. Here's what I want to leave you with today. How you can do all of this. You want to know how? Well, you have to remember this. You are not alone. God is your help. God is your help. I I want you to think that for a moment. Maybe you have to say that to yourself. God is your help. The scripture says, God is a very present help in time of trouble. God is your help. He is there with you. And those of you that, have, uh, that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the scripture tells us that Jesus didn't leave us hopeless or helpless, but he sent the Holy Spirit to live within us. So we have the helper residing within us so that we can move and do things beyond our walls of human limitation. God is our help. And yes, the pressure may be growing. Yes, the pain may be increasing. Yes, no one is celebrating you. Yes, no one is saying thank you even though you have helped them so much. Yes, the difficulties keep coming and compounding. Yes, things are happening all around you and we live in a society that's such a mess. But God is your help. You can do the good work. You can finish what he wants you to do. There's some of us that are doing things in the community around us. We, we're trying to rebuild our communities. God is our help. You're trying to rebuild your family. God is your help. 
You're trying to rebuild your own life in him. God is your help. You have to remember you are not alone in this. Even though you might feel lonely, you're not alone. God is your help. And sometimes I think we don't even recognize how great that is just knowing that. That the creator of heaven and earth, the one who is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore, the beginning and the end, is our help. And when we know, and when we're assured of, assured of the fact that God is our help and that we're not alone, there's nothing in this earth. There's nothing the enemy can throw against you. There's nothing that any individual can do, say, or imagine that can stop you. Take up the world.